This video is an excerpt from a much longer European travel skills talk. To view other topics or to watch my travel skills talk in its entirety, visit ricksteves.com or check out my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Right now I want to talk about eating your way through Europe. And one of the joys of European travel is food, right? How many of you are looking forward to eating in Europe? Nice. Well, I, I certainly am, and you don't need to be wealthy to eat well in Europe. And you want to just eat with the culture, you want to eat with the seasons, and you want to know how to find a good value. The main thing is you don't want to be attracted to the big sign in English on the most expensive square in town that says no frozen food. That's a tourist trap, just like that. They're paying way too much rent, they're just trying to snare naive, green, uh, rich tourists. And you see here, four different languages, a printed menu offering every menu item you could imagine. Everything about it is wrong. You want to find the local mom and pop place that's serving local specialties with the season. They say in much of Europe, eaters can identify the region and the month by what's on the menu. And I think that's worth thinking about because a good traveler will eat what's good with the region and what is good with the season. In this little restaurant here, you can see it's a small, humble mom and pop place. It's got paper tablecloth. You can see a couple of tourists joining the local crowd and they're eating very simply. They've got a bowl of pasta, a bottle of water, and a carafe of house wine. That's not gonna break the bank. That's gonna be a great experience. Even though for Italians that would just be a start, for us, that's the meal. That's a, a big bowl of pasta and a great scene. All over Europe, you got trendy new restaurants, uh, fun food, great food, innovative food that is affordable. You don't need any pretense, you don't need any Michelin stars, you don't need any, you know, big crowdsourcing website to tell you what's hot. You don't need to wait in a long line. You can just be tuned in to where the locals are eating and order in a smart place. I like to go to a fancy restaurant and I like to have the fancy clientele and the beautifully presented food but I don't like to have to dress up and pay $100 for a meal. You don't need to do that. You can find plenty of classy restaurants with classy clientele. And I would, say, I would say eat in these kind of restaurants, but when you do, if you're on a budget, order sparingly. Order each person a first course, split the main course, split the dessert and have a carafe of house wine instead of a bottle of fine wine. They're glad you're there. And then you're going to walk out of that place not feeling like you just ate a horse, like a lot of Americans seem to brag about, but that you ate smartly. You're not stuffed, and you were surrounded by local elegance. I would rather pay $25 for a pasta, sitting with local politicians and big shots and having all that elegance, than $15 for that same bowl of pasta down the street, if I'm in the mood for a fancy restaurant. The key is, you don't need to go broke if you order low on the menu and you share. Ask for the dessert, but ask for four spoons with it. That used to be bad style, but I'll tell you these days, they're just glad you're there. They really are. Even better than that, you'll find lots of uh, sort of funky, more mom and pop kind of places that are really ramping it up with quality. Gastro pubs, pubs serving gastronomic food, gastronomic tapas bars. Enoteca in Italy, serving fine wine by the glass and beautifully paired food. That's what I like, and that's what I recommend in my books. This would be in an Enoteca or in a gastronomic pub anywhere in Europe. Now, you want a memorable experience, and if you're going to go to a popular place, I'm telling you, in Europe, you got to make reservations. It's really important to make reservations. For years, I just thought, no, as a tourist, I'm, that's not really appropriate. You're just the same as a local person when you get on the phone and say, a table for four people, we're coming at eight o'clock. Thank you. My name, Ricardo, okay? You do that, and you'll have a table waiting for you. Otherwise, you're going to be roaming around, and every place is going to be full, and it's going to be very frustrating. Super popular restaurants sometimes have two settings. In this place, everybody goes there when they're in this little town in Tuscany. There's a seven o'clock seating and there's a nine o'clock seating. When you do go out and about, remember, at the early seating, it's gonna be more tourists, and at the late seating, it's gonna be more locals. In my research, I've learned if I go to a place at 7.30, it's gonna seem like a tourist trap. If I come back at 10, it's gonna seem like a local favorite. One's not better than the other, just remember, you eat early, you're eating with tourists, you eat late, you're eating with locals. This particular steakhouse, Wow, this man comes around with big hunks of steak. He asks you, do you want this one or that one? He tells you the cost, you say yes. He takes it back and cooks it. 
Every few minutes you hear a whack, and there's like a quarter of a cow sitting on a gurney, and there goes another slice of him. It's into the oven. It's seven minutes on this side, seven minutes on that side. Fifteen minutes later, it's on your table. This is not a good place if you're a vegetarian. <laughs> this traveler is not a vegetarian. <laughs> and she had a lifelong memory. So, there are wonderful experiences waiting for you. There are wonderful ways to eat outdoors here in this, I think this is Madrid, there used to be nothing but traffic and parking on this street, but now it's underground, it's kept out, it's in tunnels, and they've turned their parking lots into beautiful spaces. Lots of delightful places to eat out. One of my favorite chores in my research, and I'm in Europe researching for, I'm in Europe for 120 days a year, 40 days is filming my TV shows, and 80 days is on my own just researching my guidebooks, and I just love it, and I'm just working all day long and all evening, checking up things. This is one of my nights, and I don't know where I was there, but you can see I have my long list of things I need to do. On the back of the restaurant cards, I've written all my details, and I go home into the hotel and pump in all that new information into the next edition of the book. One of the keys for me, as I mentioned, is to find those local places in low-rent spots, a few blocks off the famous squares, where you have a small menu in one language, handwritten. Small, because they're just going to cook up what they can sell out and, and do uh, profitably for the day. One language, because they're targeting local return customers rather than tourists. They'd love you to be there, but their priority is local people. And handwritten, because it's shaped by what's ever fresh in the market this morning. It's really important to eat with the season. If you're in Paris hell-bent on having French onion soup in the summer, only a tourist trap is going to serve that to you. Another restaurant wouldn't serve French onion soup because that's a winter thing. If you really want your porcini mushrooms and you're traveling in May, you're there in the wrong time of year. You better tune into the white asparagus and come back in the fall. Go with the seasonal specials. That's what the daily specials are all about. That's what locals order. That's what they're happier if you order, and you'll get a better value and taste of your food. That handwritten menu indicates a good local favorite. Understand just the basic language. You've got your plat du jour, you've got, which would in this case you've got a choice of veal or, or a veal with rice pilaf, or you've got your menu express, which is a choice of ham or chicken with a green salad and french fries. Certainly no prize winning meal there, but it's 10 or 12 dollars. And you can eat in restaurants with the local people for 10 or 12 dollars if you like. The phrase book, very important, because then you know what the options are. There are a lot of good phrase books. We work very hard in our phrase books to cover all your options so you can order smartly. One thing I like to do is eat where local office workers eat. At lunchtime, I don't want an earth-shaking meal. I've got lots to do. I know it's cheaper at lunch than at dinner, but I just want to have an expedient lunch. And I ask for local, I, I line up where the local office workers line up. They eat out every day, and they know where the good values are. All over Europe, you can find government-subsidized cafeterias. Here's the cafeteria in Oslo at the City Hall, it's called a Menza, where you can eat with the local workers at a no-profit price. And remember, you've got your quick businessman's lunch and your pre-theater dinners, where you get two courses for 10 or 15 dollars, and that's a great value. Here's a meal for under 15 dollars, where you get a plate and a salad and bread and a drink in Stockholm, a notoriously expensive city. You can find very fine and affordable lunches anywhere in Europe. A nice salad and a glass of wine in France, a beautiful salad. This is the go-to salad in Greece, the Greek salad. All over Europe, I like a salad niçoise. This is pr in Nice particularly right here, but you'll find a salad niçoise, a good, healthy, inexpensive, go-to plate uh, anywhere in Europe. Uh, eat with the local cultures. In Italy, you've got an antipasto spread. It's like a salad bar, but all this antipasto stuff. In Spain, you've got the wonderful tapas. One of the challenges for us when we go to Spain is local people eat really late, and unless you want lunch at 3 and dinner at 10, you're going to have to uh, roll with the punches there, and uh, if you sit down in a restaurant at noon or 7, you're going to be eating with the staff, and you're, bad, you're, 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 you're just not very welcome. Uh, what you want to do is go to a bar, and they've got good food in their tapas bars all day long in Spain, and that's part of the cuisine scene. As I mentioned, people are sharing. Here are Germans sharing a Wurst and a sauerkraut, even sharing their beer. That would never have happened in uh, earlier days, but now they've had their economic challenges, and again, they're just happy that you're there. 
I love cultures where they have family style eating, and anywhere in Europe I opt for the family style of eating. And remember a lot of Americans think it's kind of bad style to be sharing their plates and so on, but you're curious, you're beginners, you're steep on the learning curve, and a chef loves it, even if it's not sophisticated, if you make a habit to order different things and then sample them around. You just want to eat your way through the menu, it's fun, it's part of the culture. In Greece you have the meze, and you get to order these little plates. In Spain, of course, you've got the uh, tapas. In Venice, you've got the cicchetti. All over Europe. In Italy, I find the antipasto, uh, or the uh, appetizer spread, is, is really the most interesting thing on the menu. If you have dietary concerns, and a lot of people do, whether they're gluten-free or vegan or, or going to have very bad reaction to nuts or whatever, you need to write it down on a piece of paper, and then have a local person translate it so you can show that to the waiter and not have any risk of getting what you don't want. You have to be very explicit, because a lot of waiters just go, yeah, 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 and then they ignore you. So be careful about that. A lot of people wonder about the tipping and the service and so on. I want to remind you, service and taxes are included. So if you look at a $30 meal in Europe that says service and tax included, that's like a $22 meal here where we'd add on tax and add on service. It's there already. So discount the price in your mind when you're wondering what is the value here. People ask about service, and in Europe, waiters and waitresses are paid a living wage. You don't have this very strong 10 or 15 or 20 percent uh, tipping thing that we do in the United States. Over there, locals just leave the coins on the table, round it up, or often don't tip at all. I would say, ask in each country, what are the tipping norms? Don't ask a waiter, ask somebody else, <laughs> and, and just find out what you're comfortable with. But don't lose sleep over walking out of a restaurant in Europe without tipping, because they're paid a living wage, and it's not expected like it is here. And if you tip American style in Europe, you're just raising the bar and messing up the local balance, and it's bad style. A lot of Americans complain about slow service. In America, Time is money. Bam, bam, bam. In and out. Turning the table. European restaurateurs don't want to turn the table. I mean, if, if they get popular in American guidebook, they have an early setting, because Americans prefer to eat early, and then the Americans are gone by the time their regular clientele come. But they're not really designed about turning tables in Europe. You're there all evening. Respectful, quality, good service is slow. Now, if you want fast service, you can get it. Europeans sometimes want fast service. It's just a matter of effectively communicating and say, excuse me, I have a play to go to. I need to be finished by 9 o'clock. If you can communicate that, you'll get fast service. But that is the exception, not the rule. I like music when I'm eating. I like to enjoy a cultural experience when I'm eating. And all over Europe, you can choose your restaurants with fun music along with it. Also remember, in Europe, you got fast food on every corner. You got American chains on every corner these days. That's a real loss if you go all the way to Europe and eat a lot of fast American food chain uh, food. I would recommend if you want fast food, find the delis that have the counters and the stools where the local business people go. Here we have a grocery store, an elegant grocery store that has a deli counter, and if you see in the back there on the left a bunch of local business people sitting on stools eating great food at great prices in a fancy grocery store. Also remember, all over Europe there are immigrants doing the hard work that local people don't want to do for peasant wages, and these immigrants have very tasty food traditions, they have very small budgets, and they like to go out and eat. I think immigrant restaurants are a godsend for tourists, especially up in Scandinavia, where the food tends to be really expensive and really boring. All right? You want some spicy Pakistani food or, or Lebanese food or whatever when you're in Scandinavia. All over Europe, a doner kebab is a great go-to meal for something fast and cheap. Pizza is another good standby. You can find pizza anywhere for a great price. Street food, lots of fun. Know the street food. Have a sense of adventure and enjoy that dimension of the culture. Know what the unique specialties are. This is barnacles. Barnacles in Portugal. Very expensive, but really, really good. They are the best seafood I've ever eaten. It goes with beer, and it's something we wouldn't know about if we didn't try it. Truffles, in season, a beautiful thing. Again, know what is in season and eat with the season. 
venture out, try the stinky cheese. If you want to learn more about the food, remember a great new thing is food tours. All over Europe you'll find food tours. You can Google it, you can look on TripAdvisor. In my guidebook I recommend the food tours that I've particularly enjoyed. They're not cheap, it'll cost you 80 or 90 dollars, but you get four hours, you go to eight places, you get a big meal out of it, and it's a tour and an education through a very interesting characteristic neighborhood at the same time. I really enjoy those food tours. That one's in Rome. This one is in southern France, in Avignon. Another popular experience is to go to a cooking school. These are very trendy these days. Just, uh, uh, just last year I met one of our groups in Florence and I joined them for the experience and it took a little time, but it was really fun. We prepared the food, we cooked the food, and of course when you're done cooking it, you got to eat it. And when we sat down, this is with one of our tour groups, and we ate that meal, it was clear to us this was as good as what you might have got at a restaurant. And we had the proud chef beaming over us, and we all were right there making everything from the salad and the pasta to the tiramisu. You can do that if you want to look into a cooking school. Picnicking is a European way to go, and you can create a very atmospheric, inexpensive, and healthy meal if you choose a good spot to picnic, and it causes you to go into the marketplaces. I love the marketplaces of Europe. To me, they're as important as the museums. This is the grand industrial age marketplace in Budapest. You'll find them all over Europe. This is the big market uh, stall courtyard in Nice. And here in, uh, this, in the Dordogne of France, in Sarlat, you've got not a daily market, but a once a week market. Know when the markets are and make it a point to be there. When you go into the market stalls, you'll feel the energy, you'll enjoy the local push and shove, and you'll get to test things, and you'll put together a wonderful picnic with produce that is probably tastier than produce that you've ever had here. When you go to a market, you'll find a lot of good eateries near the market. So you don't necessarily have to picnic in conjunction with your market visit. Remember, shoppers and workers know there's fresh produce and very competitive prices and very characteristic seasonal food in the little eateries that surround those markets. The best new place to have lunch in Florence is the Mercato Centrale. Industrial age marketplaces have had a big struggle in the last generation as people are going out of town to the supermarkets and so on. What they've done to revitalize them is keep the farmer's market dimension, but spice it up by letting it be outlets for fancy restaurants and outlets for creative foodies to serve right there. And in Florence, you've got a food court of fun options in that marketplace ambience, and I really love the Mercato Centrale when you're in Florence. Of course, you've got just modern grocery stores as well, all over Europe. One way or another, you can put together a beautiful picnic, and you can eat very, very cheap and healthy if you want to. Whether it's on a train ride, this is a very, very simple meal on a train, but it just cost a couple bucks in the most expensive corner of Europe. Or after a long day of sightseeing, maybe you just want to take off your shoes, stretch out, and have a simple, cheap meal while catching up on your YouTube or your TV watching or whatever in the hotel room. You've got that option, and I like to make a pantry in my hotel. I don't want an earth-shaking dinner every night, every second or third night. I just like to have a picnic in my hotel room. It's relaxing to me, it's healthy, and it is certainly cheap. In each country in Europe, you've got the local taste treats. Do your reading, make a point, make room in your budget. When you're in Belgium, if you don't try some beautiful gourmet chocolate, you don't know what you're missing. And of course, you've got the gelato scene. I love to not go with the guidebook and not go with the crowdsourcing, but go with local recommendation. What is the most popular gelateria in town? And go there and you'll feel the energy as all the kids are there enjoying great gelato. Same with coffee, wonderful coffee scene. I like to pay too much to enjoy a cup of coffee on the most expensive piece of real estate in that town and watch the scene go by. Remember, when you have a cup of coffee and you sit outside, you pay a little more, but you're not paying for the coffee. You're paying to be part of the scene. And that is integral to a quality European experience. Related to that, are the, um, the happy hour drinks. I'm not a cocktail happy hour kind of guy here, but when I'm in Europe, I like to spend half an hour or 45 minutes just enjoying a, a hard drink and some munchies on the square as everybody's out making the scene. This is the aperitivo. It's a big deal in Italy. Here we are on the main square in Siena, enjoying spending $7 for your drink, and it comes with little sandwiches and pickles and, and uh, chips and so on. And again, you're renting a spot to enjoy the show. That's what that's all about. Make the scene. In the morning, it's a market. 
in the middle of the day, it's just a work-a-day scene, and at night, the little bars spring out, and all the students and the, uh, and the, and the fun-loving people are on the square having their spritz. If you go to that square and buy a spritz and strike up a conversation, you're going to have plenty of friends. That's your challenge. The ball's in your court. They're not going to come to you, but you're more than welcome to make that scene. But it's easier to do with the appropriate drink in hand at the right time of day. You know, here at home, I never feel like a nice glass of ouzo. <laughs> but when I'm in Greece, every night, I feel like watching the sunset with a glass of ouzo. When I'm in England, I feel like a spot of tea. I don't drink tea here. I drink tea in England. I'm a cultural chameleon. When I'm in the Czech Republic, it's a good pilsner. When I'm in Tuscany, it's good red wine, and so on. Make sure that you are a cultural chameleon when it comes to the drinks and the food in your travels, and then you will have a better experience. The food really makes a huge difference, and if you know how to connect with the culture, you'll find that just as important as the museums and the galleries is experiencing and enjoying the culture through the hearth, through the dining room table, and through the kitchen. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll find lots more at ricksteves.com and on my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Happy travels and thanks for joining us.